Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Biochar Initiative's May webinar, Biochar for Better Soilless Agriculture. My name is Wendy Lou McGill, and I am IBI's Communications Director. I'll be facilitating this webinar today. I wanted to do a couple of quick notes for housekeeping before we get started with this really, truly exciting uh, presentation. Um, you should be able to hear me now and see the, the share screen of our slides. If you're hearing echoes or if your sound quality is bad, you can use the audio functions in the GoToWebinar toolbar, which is probably on the right side of your screen. And um, if you're still having any trouble, please uh, send the organizers, which would be me, a chat message using the chat function, again, on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, if we aren't able to fix it, don't worry. We'll be recording this webinar and sharing it with all registered attendees, as well as the um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I imagine that you're going to have a lot of questions about this presentation, so feel free to start sending them whenever they come up using the questions um, box, again, in the control panel that's likely on the right side of your screen. We will get to these questions after the presentations with both of our panelists. So thank you again for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, IBI board chair and biochar donian, Kathleen Draper, who's going to lead you through these great presentations. So Kathleen, take it away. Thanks, Wendy Lou, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us today to learn all about using biochar in soilist agriculture a term many may not have even heard before, including myself, but today you'll learn all about it. Before I introduce our speakers, I always like to provide a bit of background on the International Biochar Initiative for those that are new to IBI or to the biochar world. I think IBI is actually the oldest biochar NGO, yet we're more committed than ever to helping the industry scale in a sustainable manner. We anticipate finalizing our new strategic plan in the very near future and hope to share that with you by the end of June. We recognize how fast the industry is growing and we'll be putting more resources into how to train more people faster, as well as supporting more demonstrations, case studies and relevant researchers. And yes, hopefully even bringing back some steady tours, COVID permitting, of course updating and expanding standards for different biochar end uses is also in our plans. As, next slide. As many, if not most of you know, last year we received a very generous capacity building grant from the WOCA Foundation, which has enabled us to hire Wendy Liu and we're planning to hire additional resources in the very near future. Unfortunately, our executive director is taking medical leave right now due to some health issues, but we're not letting that slow us down. We'd also like to give a shout out to the growing number of sustaining business and organizational members. These represented here are just new since our last webinar a few short weeks ago. As always, your confidence and support of IBI is critical to helping us help you scale the industry. Next slide. And now a bit about our presenters. I first met Nadabzev a few years ago in Korea at a biochar conference, no surprise there. Nadav is what I call a recovering academic. And I mean no disrespect with that term as I work with a lot of excellent academics, but they do tend to live or die with a publish or perish mantra. What I find great about folks like Nadav is that they can straddle and align scientific rigor with sustainable commercialization. This is critical given our current climate crisis. His sharing of various biochar activities, successes and lessons learned, and even open sourcing different SEM images of different types of biochar is something I'd love to see a lot more often within the industry. Today, he will go into more depth about his work on displacing peat and other high embodied carbon growing media with a soilless media made in part with biochar. Even though he claims to have left academia, Nadav has been collaborating with academics throughout his endeavors and asked one of his collaborator, collaborators, Omar Frankel, a researcher with the Volcani Center in their Department of Plant Pathology and Weed Science 
to join them for today's presentation. So with that, Nadav, I'm going to hand it over to you, and we'll take questions at the end. But as Wendy Lou said, we will um, you're you're able to post them throughout the presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, should should I should I uh, start? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I'm I'm Nadav, and I'm very happy and honored to be here and uh, to share the story of Earth Biochar, my biochar business, and our first growing media product, uh, which we call CompoChar. Now, I guess some of the audience are more familiar with biochar, while others specialize with soilless growing media. I will try to talk to both, and I would love to get your feedback later. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Earth, Earth Biochar. Uh, no, it's a, uh, you need to go one back. Sorry, Wendy. Wendy, uh, yeah, th that's the one, thanks. Earth Biochar is part of all recycling park, which is uh, the biggest facility in Israel in treating organic waste. This picture shows uh, about one third of our park, which includes uh, four companies. Compostor is uh, spread all over the park with its uh, composting windows. Compostor gets about 50% of the Israeli municipal sewage sludge and the majority of municipal green waste. The gray building you see on the right is uh, shared by two co other companies in the park, Fertilo, which uh, uses the compost of compost ore to produce different kinds of slow release fertilizer pellets, and Ecologs, uh, which uses uh, wood waste to produce wood pellets and a very special poultry bedding. At the bottom, uh, you see the two activities locations of Earth Biochar, where we produce our biochar, and on the right, our R&D greenhouse. The proximity between the four companies creates many cooperations. Uh, I'm showing it first because I'm very proud being part of this group, but also to highlight critical part of our biochar business model to be as close as possible to almost endless supply of organic raw materials, and in addition, to benefit from the endless interactions between the companies. The park management is also Earth Biochar investors and partners. Next slide. Next, yeah. So uh, here we see some of our uh, raw materials the composting process, and uh, on the right, industrial wood waste uh, treatment to become wood pellets. We recycle organic waste on a national scale. Each year, more than half a million tons of organic material waste enter the park and live as agri products. Next slide. Okay, so uh, if you look uh, on the left is my home at Kibbutz Almog, right next to the Dead Sea and the Judea Desert. Of course, not all Israel looks like a desert, but still we live in an arid area. And the green field on the right grows in this desert watermelons to be ready for our very hot summer. The reason this field is green is due to a good decision the Israeli authorities took from the 60s to create a good separation between the municipal and the industrial sewage systems. This separation uh, significantly reduces toxic chemicals flow to the municipal sewerage system, and this enables the use of treated wastewater for agriculture. 
and this is what keeps our sludge suitable as a fertilizer. One click, please. When, when do you want, yeah. So this graph is from an uh, Israeli EPA report on the growing amount use of uh, sweet sludge in Israel in agriculture. And as of 2022, almost 100% is used in agriculture and about half of it comes from our park. Next slide. Here you see our pilot prototype system. It was designed and manufactured custom for us by our friends at Earth Systems in Melbourne, Australia. The picture was taken uh, two years ago on its arrival and it looks very different uh, today after many modifications we have done. Most important features in this charm maker is the continuous pyrolysis and the ability to control pyrolysis temperature and residence time. During these days, we are building our first industrial scale machine. Next slide. We started with uh, producing wood biochar, all kinds of species, what comes to the, to the park. Left picture is uh, grapefruit biochar, and on the right, is date palm branch, which grows all over in, in our area. The scanning electron microscopy reveals the beauty of uh, geometry and complexity we all got to use to see in wood biochar. Next slide, please. For a few years, my biochar experience was mostly using wood biochar as a soil additive. And the results were, were uh, some inconsistent. I saw some positive and promising effect on growth and even on chemical adsorption from polluted soils, but quite a few times also negative results. Next slide. In addition, I have started selling biochar and my first customers were what we call early adopters. They are the enthusiastic gardeners or small farmers who read everything about biochar on the internet. And they wanted to be the first who tried the black magic in their own garden or field. I encountered all the how should I use it questions. Should I mix it with compost, beneficial microbes, fertilizer, what are the ratios, will it work in my soil, and so on and on. All are very important questions with which every uh, one of us should deal with. I understood that if I want to scale my business, I need to go out and talk to the majority, such as most gardeners and farmers who are unfamiliar with biochar, less tolerant, and even suspicious. And then made me understood that my wood biochar is not yet a product and it will take too many years until people will get into the store and to the store and ask for biochar. Next slide. Well, nobody wants to eat flour yet most people consume flour on a daily basis, just not as flour. We all prefer bread, pastry, baguette, and other tasty baked car carbohydrates. And it is, of course, an analogy to biochar, which means that if we want to develop a hunger for biochar, we should do few more steps before or after pyrolysis. We should bake our biochars with specific features and properties so we can sell it as an already known product. Soilless growing media are the bread and butter for many farmers, nurseries, and gardeners. Next slide. One more. 
So why did we go soilless? Uh, one back, sorry. Thank you. So why did we go soilless? Horticulture market analysis is beyond the scope of this talk, of course, but briefly, it doesn't matter where you look, you find similar forecast concerning the horticulture market growth and the rise in global demand for growing media materials. If you look at the table, you see the estimation done by Chris Block, a horticulture specialist, which predicts raw material demand for the next 30 years. We can also understand from here and from countless magazine articles that pit is still the dominant material and that this market is seriously looking for pit replacements. And in paraphrase to Bono, we believe that biochar might be even better than the pit thing. Next slide. So 60 seconds about growing media. So growing media are the materials in which plants are grown in containers detached from soil. They could be one or mixture of components that provide water, air, nutrients, and anchorage support to the plants. The non-material are peat, coco coir, perlite, tooth, compost, and few more. Each one has its own characteristics, and they are used solely or in combination with each other to achieve certain properties. Next slide, please. Growing plants in soilless media is very different from growing in soil. The most important thing is ensuring a good balance between aeration and drainage. The medium must have good water retention, but also must provide good drainage, which open air pockets to supply oxygen. Particle material size is important factor when creating new growing media uh, blends, but some other factors influence as well. Next slide, please. Here you see the water retention behavior of different known materials. In this test, the substrate or material is saturated with water in a closed tube so when water starts to drain, we can measure the change in pressure in the tube. Sharp curve means that this material has low water holding capacity and faster aeration, while moderate curve means slow drainage, more water reservoir to the plant, but also a potential for oxygen deprivation, deprivation for the plant. As with everything in life, it's all about balance. Next slide. We started by experimenting growing uh, soilless in our greenhouse. The compost was and will be the main material we use, and we mixed into it different level of wood biochar. We were able to grow cucumbers and lettuce in all groups, but learned that while this compost is a fantastic nutritious soil additive, as a soilless media, it had many drainage problems. And the biochar addition indeed increased this mix holding capacity and slightly improved its drainage. Next slide. One more, thank you. And as, as you can see, even though biochar improved some aspects, as you can see in this lettuce experiments, increasing the amount of biochar, the wood biochar, produced smaller plants. These results are from the first growing cycle. And on the second growing cycle, uh, we had uh, bigger yields. And on the third cycle, yielded much bigger plants and even 
slightly better results from the compost biochar, uh, uh, from the compost groups. Yet, we have never met a farmer who agreed to wait two lousy growing cycles for a third good one. Once again, we understood that if we want our material to work on the first cycle, it needs a pretreatment such as charging, for example. Next slide. So what we did, we took out and mixed all these different compost biochar groups from our greenhouse and hand it over to a neighbor farmer. The picture shows his zucchini greenhouse. On the left are commercially cocoa coil grow bags and on the right, our compost biochar. Look at the difference. The compost biochar plants were not only bigger and greener, they also yielded more zucchinis. Next slide. And at this point, we have already started first trials of pyrolyzing our compost mixed with wood chips. And now let me take you um, to a side story. In this picture, you see me showing off our greenhouse to Professor Benny Hefetz, the Dean of Agriculture Faculty of the Hebrew University. Professor Hefetz studies plant absorption of pharmaceuticals from wastewater. We are sick, we take a pill or a medicine, we secrete it in the toilet, and then you can find it in the wastewater. And afterwards, after irrigation with wastewater, you can find it in your salad. So um, on the right, you can see a recent studies uh, his group published. And we started co cooperating with uh, his research group long ago to test the survival of these ph pharmaceuticals in sewage sludge before and after composting and before and after pyrolysis, of course. So we produced pyrolyzed, pyrolyzed compost, especially for this study. The laboratory took only half of what we did and we took the rest. Next slide. I didn't have much uh, from this uh, material. Um, so I just put it into these pots. The strongest thing I remember is the flow of water through the new pyrolyzed material when I first rinse it. It was obvious to me that something very interesting and good has happened during pyrolysis of the compost. I planted in them small pepper plants we, we had and came every day to see them grow very happy. And this was very unexpected because we were warned for years that when growing in biochar, you should not exceed 3% to 5% maximum wood biochar in your soils. Otherwise, bad things might happen. And my, my colleague, Dr. Frengel, will maybe will elaborate about it in a moment. But these peppers in the newborn compost jar taught us different. Next slide. Another surprising fact, which we still can't explain, is the dramatic EC reduction. Usually, we had to rinse, even wash the compost thoroughly before planting to reduce its salinity or high mineral concentration. But today, after pyrolysis, we do only minor wetting and plant. Next slide. Um, we took the same mix of compost wood chips and pyrolyzed it in three temperatures and observed how temperature influenced the compost drainage properties. And now we can also modify drainage by changing the ratio of wood chips mixed with compost before py pyrolysis. Next slide. And with a better drainage properties, we see less green algae as we used to see in times of over irrigation, 
upper picture is peat and compost, lower picture kombucha. Next slide. This is how kombucha looks like in a scanning electron microscopy. Next slide. First time I saw these pictures, I thought, oh my God, this is so ugly. We got used to see the beautiful wood biochar pictures, clean carbon, amazing geometry. At first, I didn't want nobody to see it. And today I understand that this attachment of thin mineral layer on the wooden carbon skeleton is probably what makes the magic. And it's no longer, longer, longer ugly to my eyes. Next slide. This study from uh, 2017 uh, opened my eyes to the importance of organic coating formed during co-composting as a way to activate biochar. It somehow resembled what we see in our co-pyrolyzed compochar. Next slide. Water retention test, as you've seen, showed that the basic kombucha mix has almost ideal water retention curve. And as I mentioned, we have ways to modify it even better. Next slide. The kombucha, uh, because of the compost, has a built-in macro and micro elements such as NPK and also magnesium, calcium, iron and more. This available nutrients enable growing with low mineral fertilization. And we found out it is even important at times of nutrient stress or deficiency. Next slide. So we started growing lettuce again, once again, but this time in uh, Kompochar. And we get much bigger and greener plants. And another very important result is a minimal variance between plants size and weight due to much more homogeneous material. We get great results on the first growing cycle and a week ago we harvest the fourth cycle and it keeps the same pattern. And the difference you see in these graphs doesn't look much, but they are significant. Compost lettuce mass are 60 gram higher than the tooth groups. Next slide. We have also um, noticed that the compochar own nutrients can buffer or, or lessen damages at times of water or fertilizer lack of supply. Here we count the number of black rotted tomatoes. This problem is not a disease, but rather physiological disorder caused by lack of calcium transport within the plant. The problem happened after 10 days of fertilization fault of our greenhouse irrigation system. We assume that the calcium and phosphorus reservoir of the compochar help the plants go through this deficiency period. Nutrient stress resistance, like, like you see here, has of course economic implications since in this example, black rotted tomato is not suitable for eating and marketing and could significantly reduce farmer yields. Next slide. So we, we feed the char maker <coughs> with our compost wood mix and it comes out as compost char. We have no idea what is happening inside. It's like a black box. <coughs> we notice certain difference, differences in certain properties of the material before and after pyrolysis. And there must be thousand interactions between the carbon from the wood and the minerals from the compost. So if you pyrolyze wood mixed with minerals, I urge you to read this perspective. This group from Edinburgh 
makes such a great science. They are not the first who intentionally develop smarter mineral biochars, but they succeed in giving a simple and elegant explanation for few of the phenomena we notice. Anyway, um, this is my reading recommendation for your weekend. Next slide. Anchorage is one of the most important uh, properties of soil growing subs substrates. Next slide. And plants develop strong root system in the compost jar. Here it's in comparison to tooth. Next slide. <clears throat> we recently started working with soft substrates such as peat and coco coir and we see similar uh, root system. Next slide. So here is a summary of this uh, chapter. We, uh, we see in the compost jar great drainage and aeration. Um, it has a valuable built-in nutrients bank uh, for, as a buffer for nutrient stress, low salinity, natural to slightly alkaline pH, um, and I will talk about uh, pathogen-free. The, the growth is fantastic. And in the future, a microbial difference. Next slide. Here you, um, next. Here you see uh, our cooperation with Dr. Omer uh, Frankel to develop a built-in resistance for soil disease. Dr. Frankel will elaborate on his research right after me. Next slide. So the horticulture market uh, looks for a pit replacement, but they look for environmentally friendlier material. And we think that the kombucha has a lot to offer. One ton of kombucha holds about 1.1 ton of stable CO2 for centuries. The kombucha uh, has minimal carbon footprint. Its production can be made anywhere from local organic renewed raw materials, and the pyrolysis process may break down some toxins, and I will talk about it later. Next slide. We now know that uh, the ratio between hydrogen to carbon and the ratio between oxygen and carbon are the best way to decide <clears throat> on the stability of biochar in the ground. This graph shows in the yellow rectangular, the safe zone where stable biochar are. The red dots are a ratio score of biochar made from our compost in three pyrolysis temperatures, 500, 600, and 700 Celsius degrees. The pyrolysis was done in a Pyrex system. Measurements and analysis were performed by collaborators of us. Dr. Dimitri Drabkin and René Schatten from the Institute of Geographical Sciences, Freya University at Berlin. This results gives a kosher stamp to the compost jar as a carbon sequestration material. Next slide. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, the good separation between municipal and the industrial sewage system enables the use of treated wastewater and sludge for agricultural irrigation and fertilization. We do heavy metal tests on a regular basis. Here I demonstrate the compochar heavy metals concentration on the IBI biochar standard. Red arrows with numbers are real compochar measurement usually on the good left side of the IBI range. Next slide. And if you remember this picture, <coughs> um, yes, we wanted to know what happened to toxic chemicals during pyrolysis. Uh, so it, not yet on the pharmaceuticals that Professor Hefetz is looking for um, since, since it's on ongoing research, but I will show some other interesting data we have. Next slide. Uh, this list contains 13 herbicides we measured on 
wood chips from almond orchard. We sent these samples and samples from these almond wood chips after pyrolysis as wood biochar. Next slide, please. And we found none of them. We were surprised to see three chemicals, new chemicals, apparently formed during pyrolysis. The three of them are recognized as fungicides. And from here, we can learn that the py pyrolysis process is capable to eliminate 13 herbicides, which is a very good news. And it is very interesting and certainly worth more clarification whether, for example, it can benefit biochars with some immunity level against fungal diseases. Next slide. <clears throat> so as expected, uh, no pathogens such as Salmonella and E. coli. Next slide. And also no parasite. Next slide. And as a summary for, for this chapter, the kombucha is sterilized with no pathogens. Regular heavy metals lab tests are lower than the Israeli EPA and the IBI biochar standard. And we can also see destruction of ph pharmacologic herbicides and pesticides during pyrolysis. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, this is it. Um, if we try to focus the future of horticulture, uh, we see very black future. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Nadav. That was excellent. Before we go to questions, we'll we'll hear from Omar next, and then we'll take questions at the end. But as we said before, if you have any questions, you want to put them in the question section, we'll address them at the end. So, Omar. You may be on mute. Omar, are you there? You're not muted, uh, but we can't hear you. I see you. Are you speaking? Yeah, it's the. Do you want to take the the microphone off and try it that way? Do you have? An external one? We could hear you earlier on the test. No? No? Oh, now we can. All right. OK, so I'll speak loud, and I hope it will be OK. <laughs> so can I just turn off the camera? OK, so I'm coming from the academy, and I'm doing a lot of research about biochar in the last uh, 10 years. And we studied, um, do the next slide, please. Another one. Oh, what's that? Okay, so we're we are studying uh, biochar in, in gross media, okay, in soilless uh, culture. And why do we do that? We do that because uh, we try to look for pit replacement. Uh, there is environment pressure on peatland ecosystem. The pit, uh, peatland holds huge amount of soil carbon and increasing demand and prices are always increasing. And, but uh, we also want to learn it in a soilless culture in nurseries because it's reliable in the fast trial that is easy to maneuverate and correct mistakes if relatively low cost. It's also a good arena that may take real change in, for the industry. It's also a possible solution for local organic waste. The problem is that when we are using a nurseries and soil sculpture, it will not really influence the carbon sequestering in, in the world, but we are trying to increase the concentration as much as we can. You will hear about it. Okay, next, please. Something is strange with the background. It used to be blue and yellow. It was really good, but without the blue, it's hard to see. Can you do another one? Next, please. Ooh, uh. um, okay. So when we when we're looking on the on the nurseries, okay, we're looking at the nurseries and we're trying to see 
what are the the concentration okay that are good can you do uh, just a second uh, we're looking we we're trying to look on diseases okay we're interested in diseases this is what we're studying in our lab so when we're learning about the diseases we know that is influencing um, for many many years for example for uh, rust and for powder since uh, the, 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 the 19th century next please next Okay, not one more, uh, one back, please. One Omar, back. Just, okay. just to let you know, it takes a little while. Just assume she okay. has forwarded. Yep. Something is strange with the background. It used to be blue on green and yellow, and now it's uh, yellow on white. It's hard to see. I hope it the people is, can understand yeah. what they read. I will try to do the best I can, but suddenly the, the background is not so great. Okay. Maybe if you have your slides, you can you can read through what was on the slides or the highlights. Okay, we'll I'll try. We we'll, we will fix this uh, on the slides that we send out to everybody. So our apologies. Not sure okay. what's happening. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you go one back, please? And one more. Okay, so when we are looking on systems, okay, part of system on systems that we're using a, 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 a lot of biochar on a, in the nurseries and on soil sculpture, we see that many people use the quite a high concentration of biochar. The most useful, beneficial impact of biochar was between five percent to seventy-five percent, and negative effect only occurred above 20, 20 or twenty-five percent. Again, there was nothing about diseases until now, but when we're, when you're asking what is what is the influence on the diseases? Uh, next, please. Next one. Next one. Okay, so when we're trying to check the spatial systems, we see, for example, we have an experiment here using many kinds of biochars, okay? And we are using three different concentrations. The blue, the, the light blue, the, the blue and the yellow. And we are looking on the results here. We see that usually the best performance for health index, which means when the plants are the most healthy, is the intermediate concentration of 1%. And we are trying to increase the concentration. Next, please. Next uh, push. So there will be animation. We said in some cases, on 3%, we start to see a decrease in the efficacy of the biochar against Botrytis uh, scenario, which is, a, which is a foliar pathogen. Next, please. And when we're looking on other spatial system that, uh, for example, uh, Zwart and Kim, they did in 2012, we also see that the best concentration for them was 5%. And when they increased the biochar concentration in the soil scatter, it was more, than, it was a, when they increased it to 20%, there was more disease than 5%, and actually more disease under the control. Next, please. Okay, and when we studied another system of Rhizoctonia, again, we can see that on one, uh, can we put one more push, one more, uh, next please. And yeah, stop here, please. Okay, so we can see here that on 1%, we have the best uh, efficacy on eucalyptus biochar, and on 0.5%, the best efficacy for, uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for another kind of biochar, uh, the, the greenhouse waste. Okay, when we're looking at all of the systems, we see that in most of the pathos system, at least 46% of the work suggests that diseases are not suppressed at the highest amenant concentration where people used in the, in the pathos system. Okay, oh, this is too fast. Okay, okay. so for example, if, if biochar was efficient in most of the cases, but on the highest concentration, we started to see a problem. And this is where we, we, we dive into this uh, challenge because we want to see how can we avoid this uh, problem high concentration. Next, please. Okay, we also see this kind of a U shape of what we call on a growth. Okay, on growth, we see, in, for example, in this study of uh, Rajko et al. in 2012, that in some concentration, in some biochars, the low, the lowest concentration was not efficient. The intermediate concentration was efficient, and when we increase the concentration, the efficacy decreases as well. So we have this U shape also for the growth. But next, please. Ooh, something is really wrong with the background. I don't know what what happened. Uh, 
Next, please. It's impossible to explain this. Okay. So when we are looking on two uh, curves, okay, one of the curves, the one on the left, that will be the curve of the disease, okay? So we see that in most of the pathosystems, the, the it's no, low concentration of one to three percent, the best, the, the, the efficacy is really high, so we can reduce the disease, but we still have space that we want to exploit because the, the effect of the, the concentration on the growth will be in higher concentration of biochar, it will be about five or six percent. So we have seen, we can, we can take advantage of the biochar to be able to stretch the border of the beneficial effect of the biochar against diseases, we will have a much better soilless culture in our studies, okay, in our, in, for the industry. So can we extend this border of biochar positive effect on disease suppression? Can we improve the control efficacy of the biochar? Next, please. Next one. Okay, something is wrong with the, with the colors. There are supposed to be so many words over there. Okay, so what we want to do now is to study, to see what is the effect of biochar on soil bone disease and plant health, okay? So the first uh, model we use, Fusarum oxysporum uh, radicis cleocopericii. This is a disease that causes the root rot, uh, a crown rot of a tomato. It's a very serious disease around the world. It attacks tomato plants. It reduces the, the yield also in a soil culture. And we use two kinds of biochar to study the system. Next, please. Okay, and here we have the graphs of what happened. When we are adding zero biochar, okay, the soil culture of a peat and turf with the disease in blue is increasing quite, quite quite high, it's reaching 70% of death. Okay, and when we are in introducing biochar into the system, the red, the green, and the purple, the disease is decreased, okay, to uh, when you're using 3% of biochar, it is around 25%, okay? Next one, please. Okay, this is another kind of biochar, the greenhouse waste. It's also, we can see the same pattern that we are reducing the disease by using biochar inside the soil culture. Um, next, please. We can see that it's also influenced the canopy dry weight. Okay, here we can see the two kinds of biochar when they are increased from zero to three percent in the experiment. We can see that the the canopy dry weight is increasing significantly for the non-inoculated and also for the inoculated plants. Next, please. We can see it's also uh, influencing the photosynthesis rate. When we're introducing biochar up to 3%, we can increase the, the photos, photosynthetic rate, okay, for the non-inoculated and the inoculated plants. Next, please. Okay, so how does biochar work? Okay, we start to study the mechanism because if we will not study the mechanism, it will be very hard for us to try and incorporate biochar into the soil culture to reduce plant disease. So we have to learn the mechanism. And next, please. Okay, next one. No, uh, uh, it's okay. Okay, next one. Okay, stop, stop. Okay, so we have free access for the disease for each disease. Okay, disease is influenced by the uh, by the environment, by the plant uh, itself, and by the pathogen. So first, we want to see what is the influence on the environment. First, we check the 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 soil nutrient. And because we are introducing, a, we are fertigating an access, there were no diff significant differences between the biochar uh, media and the soilless without the biochar. Okay, and next one, please. Next one. Okay. And when we're checking the physicochemical characteristic, we see that when we're adding this uh, one or three percent of biochar, the pH is not uh, influenced much, okay? And also for the EC value, again, we're using one to three percent of biochar at this stage. So we also do not think that these uh, differences are the one that, uh, that influence the fusarium uh, effect. Next one. And our main suspicion, uh, next one, please. 
how many, okay, so we try to see maybe it's the biochar is influencing the, the, the pathogen itself. Maybe we are, maybe biochar is simply toxic to the pathogen. And we did some tests. Okay, we did it on the original biochar, on the biochar extract, we just washed the biochar and, on the, and we used the, the extract itself. And when we use the biochar skeleton and we try to introduce high concentration, the same concentration we use in the, in the soil as culture. And we see that actually by, by this concentration of biochar do not affect the fungi. So what's happened here? There is no influence on the physiochemical, not influence on the fungi. And we believe the influence is uh, because of bacteria. Next one, please. The next one. Okay, but why would we think that? Because when we are checking the concentration of the fusarium in the soil with the biochar, okay, we see that the, the set of the, of the fusarium, the disease, yeah, of the fungi, is decreasing as, much, as long as we increase the biochar concentration. But again, it doesn't influence the, the, the fungi itself, but it cannot survive those. So what can be the reason for that? And we believe that this is the composition of the microbial community. And from th since 2016, next please, we are studying this uh, composition of the biochar, of the bacteria in the biochar. We are studying it uh, on the bacteria and also on the fungi. Next, please. We also study the metabolic potential and diversity of the microbial community in the soil. And we, we, we extract the DNA from the soil, okay, and we extracted the bacteria from the soil. Next one. And we see that the, the, the composition of the bacteria in the control, that's the biochar uh, environment, is very different. Okay, you can see, now this is a, a bioinformatic aspect, but you can see that there are two different clusters, one with biochar and then we are without, without biochar. And they are very different, the composition. Next one. And same go for the fungi. We see that the fungal population is very different for the biochar-induced population and the soil, soilless uh, without the biochar. Okay, that's the pit. It's very, very different. And when we look, next one. And when we look into the into the, the composition of the bacteria and the fungi, we see that they're also very, the composition is very different. Next, please. Next, please. Can you push the button, please? Okay, we will, uh, who, are the, who are the population that are different? We can recognize Blue Cordelia, we recognize Flavobacterium, we recognize Pseudomonas. They are increased when we are using biochar. And this population, some of them, yeah, not all of them, of course, but some of them are known to take part in biological control of many uh, diseases. Okay, next, please. For example, we are using also a cultural base for checking the percentage of the, of the, the amount of the flores and pseudomonas, okay, that also includes a lot of species which are known to be biological control agent. And we see that when we are using biochar, the concentration is increasing. Next, please. And you can also see that on plates, they have an inhibitionary effect against uh, the fusarium. Okay, here we can see on the test, when we are use, we're using E. coli as a control, it does, doesn't affect the, 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 the fusarium. But on the right, when we are using uh, the flow of pseudomonas that we isolated, it decreases the size of the fusarium colony and showing that it has some antifungal effect against the, 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 the pathogen. Next, please. Okay, next, please. So we can see here that actually increasing, adding biochar is increasing the diversity of the bacteria in the soil, okay, and also for the for the for the fungi. And we can also see it on the right side that it's actually increasing the respiratory and the activity of the bacterial community in the in, in with the with the biochar. Next. Okay. Next. Next. Okay, one of our new st studies again. So we see this uh, this results, and now we want to to, to be sure that they're actually these bacteria are very important. So we used also another uh, approach. Okay, in in plants there are two main, in general speaking, there are two uh, pathways to for defending. One of them is related to the salicylic acid, which mostly relate on uh, chemical 
a plant reaction to chemical, to chemical which are in the soil, like phenolic compound and other compound. And the other is the jasmonic acid pathway and the ethylene pathway, which is all, all usually induced by the present of, a, of a, the mi microorganism in the soil. They're inducing the resistance of the plant. So we try to see what uh, which pathway is more uh, influenced. If it's going to be the salicylic acid, so maybe the bacteria are not, uh, not as important, but if it's going to be the jasmonic acid pathway, it will give us another hint that the bacteria is quite important to the system. Next, please. Uh, okay, so again, we use the Fusarium oxysporum. This time we inoculated the plant above the ground. We use this and we inoculated the cola region. So actually the pathogen doesn't uh, feel the bacterial population in the soil. And when we do that, okay, we are, uh, we, are it's, uh, we're, uh, we're checking the induced resistance, which means only the influence of the plants or other parts of the plant, and not the one that's in the soil, against the disease, okay? Because the bacteria do not touch the pathogen at all, which is like one centimeter above. Next, please. We use a, okay, so we can see here, okay, that it's actually working, that the control plants are much more uh, sensitive without the biochar, okay? When we add a biochar, the disease is decreased significantly from 75%, again, 25 or to 30%, depends on the biochar concentration. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Next. Okay, so what we did, we try, uh, what we try to to do the transcriptomic uh, of the plant to, to see the expression of the genes. And when we did that, we saw that the genes of the dismonic acid were increased, while the, the the genes of the salicylic acid were not increased that much. And then we used mutant of plant. Next, please. Next. 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 Okay, this one we use mutant. Okay, plants that have deficiency in a gene that uh, in the in the salicylic in the in, in the salicylic acid pathway, and we see that actually, you know, for, on the le left side you see the salicylic acid. Okay, the, the regular plants without biochar, and on the second uh, column, you see it with a uh, free percent of biochar, and see that this is decreased. So now we are knocking down the gene, okay, of the salicylic acid, and we see that nothing really changed on the blue column, okay? So it means that the salicylic acid, the pathway, is not so important for the biochar. Next, please. Next, please. And we are checking mutant, for the jasmonic acid pathway, we see on the left, again, that when we are using the, the white plant, okay, without the mutation, yes, biochar is working. And now when we are using the mutant, with the, the, when the jasmonic acid pathway is the knockdown, we don't see any, any influence, which means that the jasmonic acid pathway in this, the, in this mutant cannot, uh, is not activated, okay? So it means that the jasmonic acid is taking, it is very important in the defense system and probably, again, probably microorganisms are involved. Okay, so we know now that but the microorganisms are very important and we have to harness the microbiome for our uh, users. But you know, taking one bacteria and putting it in the soil is hard. We try to find method how to uh, activate all of the microbiome for our good. And next please. So then we try and we use the, next one please. Next one. Okay, so what we do, try to do now is to see how we can stretch the border of the biochar because we see that for fusarium, we can reach 3% with no problem. But we're taking another pathogen. This is the, the most uh, uh, stubborn or hardest pathogen of all, the Pitium and Fanny Dermatum. This is another soybean pathogen that doesn't, uh, when biochar doesn't work against it. We tried to do this many, many years, to 2010, 2014, and it never worked. So you see, we are using biochar concentration, it doesn't influence the pinterest the matter, even increasing the disease. And we, try, we took this challenge, how would you stretch the border for the speech of a dermato? That would be the, the case study, if we, were able to, if we were able to do that, we can actually win, you know, the, this, uh, this war against uh, the pistol. 
with the biochar. Next, please. So our approach was a preconditioning of the growth medium. We know, we understand that the, bio, that the, the, the microorganism population is very important. So how do we stress the border? How can we make biochar working on 3% for all of the disease? And then how can we make it work in higher concentration, even higher concentration than that? So we are trying to activate the biochar now. In the same way, you know, people are activating compost all the time, but they do not activate the biochar. So we put the biochar in the soil, okay, with uh, for 45 days on the first stage. Next, please. And we are actually preconditioning the biochar. Okay, next, please. We are using again these two kinds of biochar: the eucalyptus and the greenhouse waste. And we're using concentration increasing from zero to three. And we are using soil which was not conditioned with and without biochar. And soil that again, soil is a pit with preconditioned with biochar, okay, and not preconditioned with biochar. Next. Okay, this is how we did that. We just put the irrigation system, the fertigation system for 45 days. Okay, and these are the preconditioned treatment. And we put the non-conditioned treatment. We, we, we waited it once a week just as we stay wet. And that's about it. So next, next slide, please. And what we can see here is very interesting. We are using the uh, the upper graph, the non-conditioned biochar. There is no influence on the pigeon. We can put biochar, we can put the plant, and there is no influence on the pigeon. But when we are preconditioning the biochar, okay, on the blue, on the on the, on the lowest graph, on the blue, you can see the preconditioned without biochar. This is very high. But when we are activating the biochar, look on the purple one or the yeah, light green one, the disease is decreased by more than 50%. Next, please. Okay, this is how it looks, okay, for the eucalyptus and for the greenhouse. On the dark uh, columns, you can see the non-conditioned biochar. On the light column, you can see the preconditioned biochar. How the disease is decreased on higher concentration, suddenly it's decreased on higher concentration on the most stubborn soybean pathogen that we learn in our lab. Next one. Okay, it's also affect uh, other, um, other um, uh, one, uh, one before, please. I'll just show the animation, I think. We can okay. We can see that this preconditioning is also very beneficial for the plant height. Okay, for both biochar. Okay, it's also for the non-conditioned biochar. But we are activating the biochar, it increase the plant height in higher concentration. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, we can see that the activated biochar is on the left side. You see that it is decreasing the population of the pits you much more when it is activated okay on the on the dark one you see the non-activated by uh, media and on the light uh, column you can see the activated media is actually decreased significantly and we are looking on the on the on the right side on the floor sent uh, pseudomonas we see how much it increased with the preconditioning because you see the dark one hardly change but the light uh, uh, green is increasing significantly for the fluorescent and pseudomonas and for the general bacteria. So the population is increased by this uh, preconditioning. Next, please. Okay. So, okay. Stop here, please. Okay. Again, you can see here how much this preconditioning is influencing the population of the bacteria against the P2. Next one. Next. Okay, you can see here. Okay, you can you can stay here. Okay, so actually we can also see here that the, the diversity of the bacteria and the fungi in this preconditioned uh, culture in uh, media is increasing significantly. Look on the, on the on the right column of each graph, the light green. How much is increased compared to the other situation of non-conditioned biochar, uh, non-conditioned soil, and uh, non-conditioned uh, biochar okay and conditioned soil without biochar okay so the biochar uh, conditions uh, condition the media is increasing significantly for the diversity next please okay and the interesting thing is again we're looking on the population we can actually uh, can you push uh, once more and again another one we can actually see that when we are looking on the unique 
bacteria inside the population for the precondition they controlled, just the activating a bit. There are 18 the species of OTUs, or actually species, okay, of bacteria that are unique only to this conditioning. But when you're looking at the preconditioning uh, pit with biochar, we can see that 20, 221 unique species exist only in this menu. And this is something that we can explode for the future. Next, please. Okay, this is the, the, the fungal. You have to believe me that it's the uh, same thing goes for, for, the, for, the, for the fungi. Next, please. Because we are a little bit stressed in time, I want some, to say something more, which is very important. Next, please. Next. 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 Okay, sorry, one before. When we look at the population, okay, we can see that again, specific uh, genus, which are important, with some of them, okay, some of the species in this uh, genus are important for biological control, like Devosia, like Pseudomonas, like Flavobacterium, are increased in this, uh, in this uh, preconditioned uh, biochar. I mean, again, we can use these populations and we can use to, to control the disease. And this is uh, the, the next uh, step. Next. It's next one. When we're looking at the, of the fungi, we can see that so many known biological control a, a family from the bio, biological control agent like Trichoderma are also increased in this preconditioned biochar. So this system, as we see, okay, next one. So this system, as you can see, is very beneficial when we try to increase the beneficial population of the uh, of biochar in soilless culture. Uh, okay, next one. And one more push, one slight push. Another one. Okay. We have to be careful with what we are saying because they're also influenced, of course, on the, the precondition also influence, influencing the, the soil properties. Okay. For example, if we are comparing uh, the control with the greenhouse with the biochar on the same, if we are just mixing it and checking the property of the dissolved organic carbon or electric conductivity or dissolving organic carbon. Uh, of course, the, when we are washing the the, 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 the biochar, the, the, there are changes. Okay, but uh, if we are doing the preconditioning, uh, okay, uh, biochar and the preconditioning uh, pit, there are hardly any changes. Okay, which means that this that uh, this uh, 45 days of a uh, of a uh, preactivation reduce the possible phytotoxic compound present in biochar during preconditioning and uh, probably via leaching or microbial degradation of specific compounds. Next, please. Okay, next, please. Next, please. Uh, next one, please. Okay, so we learned a lot about this biochar. This preconditioning was very important. So how are we going to implement it into our nurseries? Okay, so we know that this preconditioning is important. But you know, when we are checking it for 45 days, it's simply too long. Nobody can, uh, can uh, precondition is, is a media for 45 days. It has to be less. So we try to see for how long can we do the preconditioning, okay? And getting the best effect. We want, next one. Next one. And this graph shows us, okay, the different on the X axis, the time after the preconditioning. So we are preconditioning this the the biochar in the soil or soil without biochar for five days, 14 days, 30 days, and 45 days. The lower graph, as you can see there, it's a preconditioned eucalyptus and preconditioned eucalyptus in three percent and one percent. And we can see that actually after 15 days, that we are getting the 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 best reduction of the uh, pitium. Okay. And it is as good as 45 days, which means we do not need to, uh, to precondition the biochar in, in the soilless media for 45 days. We can get by by 15%, and we can even get beneficial effect after seven days. Okay, not as good as the 15 days, but so we this is much more normal, feasible, and we can uh, something that nursery can use and implement into their uh, system. Next, please. Okay, we, we took the plants, uh, no, we have also control plants. So we took the plants and we checked for another uh, disease. This was a uh, botrytis cinerea. 
it's a, it's a, it's a foliar disease of, a, of a tomato. And when we took this uh, small, uh, the small seedlings, we put it inside soilless uh, culture, okay, the pit. We saw something very interesting that this small uh, amount of uh, biochar in the root, inside the big pot, was enough to reduce the disease for almost uh, 60, very, very, very high efficacy and for 65 days. So a small, a, a part, a, a, a small uh, plant with a very small amount of voucher in his root was actually uh, inducing resistance for 65 days after uh, it was implemented. And this is a very something that we should also learn that it's not all fetium, it's not all fusarium. There are other, also this uh, foliar pathogen, which also have beneficial effect, about to have beneficial effect on them. Omar, uh, could you wrap up, please? Yes, this is the last uh, slide, actually. The next one, please. Okay, so after understanding the, bene the benefits and limitation of biochar, again, different pathogens, the next step is designing the biochar-based products. Now, until now, I you know, this, is a, this is really new, what I'm showing you now. I'm not showing too much results, just explaining about it. Uh, until now, we are you very, very careful. We use the 1% or 3%. We didn't want to push the biochar concentration higher. But I do admit that when we are now using the comp the comp char with the compost oil, if we also have a, we designed a, a substrate that we can reach a concentration of up to 20% that have benefit effect on the on the on bio, on the on the fusarium diseases. Okay, and we are now doing experiments. You can see here a control versus 20% biochar. And we even use higher concentration of a uh, computer and it's actually we, we have some very positive results that we can probably uh, report in the future next one just want to acknowledge my collaborators uh, dr uh, professor Alan graber and igal elad uh, eddie citrin and ben 11 North seller from volcanic center one great uh, phd student now is the doctor uh, dr amit uh, kumar jeshwal uh, did most of the work, and also Mr. Tal Samocha did his master. And we have other uh, industry, uh, in, industry uh, collaborator from Christian Nurseries, from the extension unit, uh, our lab technician, compost all, and uh, the chief scientist who uh, funded this, uh, this grant. Thank you very much. That's Thank you it. very much. Uh, so I'm trying to decide what my favorite quotes were. Uh, I think from Nadav, it was the beauty of the geometry of biochar. Uh, <laughs> and then from uh, Omer, you were uh, positioning biochar as um, being able to win the war on Pythium. I like those framings of biochar. Um, we do have some questions that I wanted to get to uh, before our time is up. Um, and one was uh, a question on whether the pyrolyzed municipal waste is mixed and used immediately with the biochar or does it need time to inoculate? Okay, so um, maybe I haven't uh, told it uh, very accurate, but we we take the sewage sludge and we mix it with with uh, green waste and then we we, we do a full composting process and my company, Elf Biochar, actually we buy this compost from compost ore and then we add uh, one more volume of, uh, it's actually somebody asked me, it's a one-to-one -one volume of this compost with wood chips. We mix it until it's homogeneous and then we pyrolyze it if this is, Answering the question. Right, and then it's ready to go. Yeah. You don't need to wait or do anything more to it, right? That's it. Um, somebody was asking about feedstock, and I don't know if this is within your comfort zone, but they were asking whether pallet material is a good source uh, to make biochar. Which, like, like what? Pallets, you know, the, the wooden pallets that are used for shipping. Oh, wood? Ah, the ah, the pellets that you've seen in the, in the video, we don't use it. Uh, we don't use it uh, to do the biochar. We use these pellet pellets uh, only to make wood pellets for as fuel. 
okay so uh, they we, we we put this material uh, on the side only for uh, fuel uh, wood pellets i did i did uh, work with wood pellets that uh, ecologs the other company is may is is producing from uh, agricultural uh, trimmings and this is this is fantastic material to to char but uh, it's too expensive uh, we use only waste well, i think this may be a, a language issue because he was saying pallets not pellets and i know of at least one company in the u.s that is definitely using pallet waste um but i think there's actually several more uh, and, so, I, and i yeah so maybe you, you can but uh, i I'm not saying that this material is not suitable to be biochar. I'm saying yeah. that in, yeah. in our park, we use this material as a source for fuel wood pellets. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, yeah, I, I use, okay. yeah. And then Omer, there was a question about when you were talking about the percent of biochar from three to 20%, was that by weight or by volume? We get this question all the time. We are using weight by weight. <laughs> okay. Three percent, three, three, yeah, three percent weight. Okay, and then another question. I think this is for you regarding damping off. What are you preconditioning the biochar with? Just uh, NPK, just NPK. Oh, so fertilizer. We just uh, the, the the most important thing that the bacteria will be activated just with the simple uh, fertigation nothing nothing no magic there mm -hmm. but this is really important without it you see that the, 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 only the disease which are very long that uh, takes many days like fusarium the brush has an effect but with the disease which attack very fast like petium you must activate the soil before otherwise there will be no effect and that's simply fertigation nothing special yeah, the 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 preconditioning is irrigating the the soil with NPK. Yes. Uh, and a question for you, Nadav: Do you test for PFAS after pyrolysis? It's a big topic these days in the biochar world. N not yet, but um, it, the, uh, it is going to happen very soon because we are. Uh, entering the carbon credit um, market and we, we are going to send our materials to to uh, laboratories that will check this as well yeah and i will just say on that topic that ibi has asked keo enders to uh, write a, a brief overview based on current literature and commercial efforts on how biochar can mitigate some of the PFAS exposure, either in sewage sludge itself during pyrolysis or afterwards when it's already in soils or in water. And we're hoping to have that uh, done sometime in June. So, uh, oh, and then- I've, I've, the, seen, I've seen works, I've seen studies about it, but we are going to get into it uh, in, in any case because uh, when I look at the future, I, I see that uh, the regulatory in every state is going to to look at it. So we want to be one step ahead. Yes, we're, we're already getting feedback from people that don't know all that much about biochar that they're concerned about pyrolyzing sewage sludge um, because of the PFAS. But we have seen reports, including some written by the US EPA, saying that pyrolysis can eliminate those in, during you know i can i can tell you i can tell you that for now um we haven't checked everything but the 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 chemicals the toxic chemicals that we did test and uh, actually the the pyrolysis is uh, some some cure for all kinds of toxic uh, chemicals you can find it everywhere in any case you could find it in compost you can find it in in wood chips from orchards you can find it everywhere. So the, the pyrolysis process is, uh, I think, a, a promise in this uh, question. Yes, absolutely. Uh, 
Well, and then do you want to just tell them we were speaking before everybody came on about your scaling up plans, Nadav? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, during these days, uh, we are building our first uh, industrial scale machine. It's uh, with with um, an Israeli manufacturer. Um, we have large hopes in this machine. So it, it will bring us from uh, pod production of one cubic meter per day to something like 50 or 60 cubic meters per day. And we are already into uh, building this uh, market. We are focused on soilless culture media. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, I think um, we have something very good to offer. We are in a time that prices of import, in, uh, product that are import, imported to Israel uh, is really raised because of COVID-19 and the Ukrainian war. And so, so we can give a really um, attractive, much attractive prices even in this uh, in in the in the marketing area, but nevertheless the the, the composure is as as is is uh, a very good uh, soil culture media when we check it comparing it, all the rest. Yeah, that's the kind of scaling we need, everybody. Faster, further. Uh, I think we're pretty much done questions. So uh, thank you both. We will definitely fix the problems with the slides when we send them out later this week. Not quite sure what happened, but uh, we'll figure it out. It, and um, Wendy Lou, if you could go to the next slide. Just wanted to give everybody a heads up on some things that are coming up over the next few months. We are starting to... Uh, um, finish up our uh, planning for additional future webinars. We had been going to have one on PFAS next month, but because the the biochar milestone winners uh, for the X Prize uh, are willing to work with us, we're going to host that as well. So so far, we've heard back from two of the three winners, uh, and we're um, trying to get the X Prize organizers to participate as well. But that has yet to be seen. Uh, due to the um, popular popularity of the forum in December, using that uh, technology uh, that everyone seems to have liked, we are going to be hosting uh, a networking meeting for IBI members in July, a date to be determined. And then we also just wanted to say that we will be having another annual symposium and the theme will be raising climate ambitions with biochar. Uh, and just a reminder for for members, we do have an, uh, a growing IBI podcast series focusing on different uh, pyrolysis technologies. And, and then uh, Wendy Lou has highlighted a few in-person events coming up, uh, and we hope to see many of you attending those. Next slide. Oh, and as we usually do, if, if those of you that paid to attend this webinar would like to become an IBI member, we have this offer open through the end of the month. And we thank you for that. So I'll, I'll go back to our speakers. Uh, if there's any final thoughts that, that I sort of rushed you through that you wanted to say, we have a couple minutes. Yep. Just to, uh, to say something that the, the, the new experiment that we are doing with the computer is with fusarium right now, not with the pithium. Okay, so. I wouldn't uh, suggest somebody to use 20% for pitching right now, okay? Just to <laughs> make it clear. Okay. And uh, maybe last wo few words. Uh, I want to thank you, Kathleen and uh, Wendy, for the inv invitation. It, uh, it it has done really terrific things uh, for me to, to produce this uh, presentation and to be here. It is huge honor for me so thank you very much oh our pleasure all right well thank you everyone and we hope you'll join us next month bye-bye